let's 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 read this one. If you just follow along in your Bibles, I'll I'll read it out loud for you. Starting in chapter two, verse twelve. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has or does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever." All right, now we're going to divide this into two parts. The first part is what I would call the test of growth. And that was the part about the dear children, fathers, young men. And then it repeats it, dear children, fathers, young men. And then the second part would be the test of the love of the world. And remember, what, do, what is John trying to give us in this epistle? What is his point No, that's in, maybe that's in this section, but what's, what is his purpose? What does he want to, at the end of this epistle, when his readers read it and finished the letter, they'd go, I know what that, I know why John wrote me. It was in chapter 5, verse 13. What? Wow, a whole week has gone by and everybody's just, whoo, dropped off. Huh, what was that, was that? Yes, I write this so that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know it. You know it, you know it, you know it, you know it. So, if this is a know it, know it, know it, know it, know it, then I have to pass a yes. test. Thank you very much. Yes, there's a series of tests. What are the tests? The test is, well, in the first chapter we had that we believed and know that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. He came in the flesh. That was one. Anybody who denies that is not of God. We have fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ as a result, and our joy is made complete. We had that we admit our sin. People who are not of the Lord do not admit their sin. They're more righteous than everybody else. We looked at Laodicea and said, chances are that's probably what they were having a problem with. They felt they were self-sufficient, had no need for anything. They were okay, they were rich, they were fine. And Jesus says, and that's one of our memory verses, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. So a true Christian, a test of a true Christian, is that we confess and admit our sin, our falling, our shortcomings. Then what was the next one? We don't know. Our teacher doesn't use the board. Ooh, burn. <laughs> burn? We're on test three. We're on test three. What is test three? Someone who actually takes notes in class. If we follow his commandments. Huh? If we follow obey. his commandments. Obey or follow his commands or commandments. And we talked about that, that that was more than just doing the right thing or doing a law, that it was Our what? Had to be bent to follow. Yes, our heart had a passion, a bent, a desire to see that the law, that the commands, that the things that God counted as being right and holy and just, we followed and felt that that was something we wanted to do. We, it, it held the idea of guarding or cherishing or protecting God's commands. Not so much the law, but the heart of God, the, I, the, the character and truth of God. And therefore, in verse 6 of chapter 2, we had the idea that whoever claims to live in him, in God, in Christ, must also walk as Jesus walked. Your life must parallel Jesus' life. 
That is your third test. Is that correct? Did I get it right? Three? All right, what was number four? Love your brother. Love your brother. Thank you very much. Why was that number four? Why is loving your brother, what does that have to do with knowing you're saved, knowing you're you have eternal brother, life? You don't love God. If you don't love your brother, you don't love God. Isn't that what it says? Where does it say that? How about verse 10? Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is what? Verse 11. Verse 11, if he hates his brother, is in the darkness, and walks around in the darkness, and doesn't know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Right? Okay, test four. That was test four that they love their brother. Right? Okay, now we get into this next section, and this next section, I don't know about you, did anybody feel that it seemed a bit out of place? Why would John go into this idea of children and young men and fathers and then back to children and young men and fathers again? What's up with this? What is, what is, what is John all about in this one? Is he illustrating the cycles that we go through in life and our faith? The cycles. What do you mean by cycles? Well, not everyone's, you know, not like we're supposed to be, but not everyone is you know, on fire and, you know, growing and being close to him. Sometimes we go through, you know, dark times without him, not because he left us, but because we, you know, left him behind and we were off doing our own thing. And then you come back and it's new and it's fresh and then you, you grow again and then Okay, so you're talking. You're talking growth. You're talking about the, the the growing pains of life, and and are you talking physical life, or are you talking spiritual life? I'm talking spiritual life. Spiritual life. Yes, John is talking about spiritual life, and he has three ages of spiritual growth, three phases. He has children, he has young men, and he has fathers, and. It's interesting, he, ha he starts with dear children, talks about fathers, and then comes back to young men. Goes to children, talks about fathers, and then ends with young men again. What do you think? Do you think that this is another test? Or, or is there another reason why John seems to all of a sudden jumped into spiritual growth? What do you think, Nikki? It's a test. You think it's a test? What kind of test? Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Let me ask you a question. Let's take this, this here plant, okay? Let's make this plant a little itty bitty seed and I put the seed in the ground and I water it and I take care of it. And it begins to what? Grow. grow. And it's a little sprout. It's about that big. has a little couple leaves on it and it's, it's grown. And all of a sudden it stops. What do I, how do I look at that plant? I mean, years it is doing nothing. It's just, just that big. Growth spurt. Stuck on children? Stuck on children, maybe? But I'm just, from the standpoint of a plant, if you had a plant and it, you planted it and it grew four inches and then stopped, it might be dead. Right? Why? Because it stopped growing. It stopped growing. What do we have inside us? Spirit of God. Spirit of God. What New else? Life. Huh? New life. Life. L-I-F-E? Yes. What does life mean? 
Huh? Growth. Growth? Why, why does life equal growth? Because otherwise it's death. Otherwise it's dead. We're constantly growing until we die. Huh? We're constantly growing until we die. We're constantly growing. Perhaps John's point in this, maybe one of them, and I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying this is something to think about, is that evidence of having Christ's life within us is that that life grows out, that we grow deeper, we grow up, we mature, we move closer to that father status rather than staying as babies all our life. Look for a moment uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to see if we can't put this section back into this passage a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Do you have it, Nikki? Why don't you read it? Justin, you want to try it? You want to do it this one, and then I can call out the... Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. There you go. You got it. You got it. Chapter 3. Okay. Yeah, if you want. Verses 1 through 3. Brothers, I cannot address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Okay. What's the problem with Corinth? The people at Corinth? They're acting like babies. They're acting like babies. Not only are they acting like babies, they're acting like babies still. That's a problem. These folks haven't grown up. Yeah, it says you are babies. You are mere infants. You are only infants in Christ. Well, they might be adults, but they might be teenagers too. Would you call them retarded? I don't know that I would call them retarded, but their life is retarded. Sure, sure. They are not growing. Something is wrong. So they are still worldly. They're still stuck in the world. They haven't graduated out of the world yet, grown out of the world. They're still stuck on jealousies and quarrelings. They're still modeling old life, not new life. That's one. Isn't it curious that they mention two things as a sign of immaturity, and one is jealousy... And the other is quarreling. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not talking about other sins right here that are the evidences, but those say you as a group are spiritually retarded. You quit growing. Well, if you go on, he'll explain why jealousy and the quarreling were the big deal. It's because... There were schisms. There were little cliques. Oh, I'll follow Paul. Oh, I'll be of Apollos, who was another teacher. Oh, I'm of Christ. I'm of John the Baptist. I'm this. And because I am, you, I am better than you. My teacher's better than your teacher. And you have this fighting amongst each other. And he says, you are babies you are mere infants, and you should be older by now. You should be, on, be beyond this, and you're not. It's a spanking. He's smacking them. We, still have that we do, in many ways. But should we? No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Okay, let's go on to another one. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. 
It's a little bit more to the right, Justin. 1 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Starting in verse 11, we're going to read 11 through 16. Ed, would you be willing to read uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through uh, 16, please? Okay. Chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, right? Uh-huh. Verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attain, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is the hand, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, so what is God doing in the body? Verse 12. Phyllis, what does it look like God's doing in the body? Preparing God's people for works of service. Right. Preparing God's people for service, for unity, in the spirit, in knowledge, so that we can have the fullness of Christ. And what is the result? When we have that fullness, when we've reached that maturity, what is the result? Starting in 14. Okay, stop right there. There's a couple parts on that one. The first one is thrown to and fro by the waves. What is that? It's being, it's being wishy-washy. It's not being firm in your faith. Uh, uh, almost. Waves are specific. Waves are trials and temptations and troubles. Mostly trials and troubles. We read, I believe it's in James, and he talks about that the waves that come on and we're being moved to and fro in the first chapter of James, and that if we are in Christ, we're, we're following God, we're doing what we're supposed to do, we are not doubting God during those times of trials and when the waves hit and are going back and forth, those, the winds blow to and fro. There's another part, and that is the second part, and that is uh, uh, blown here and there by every wind of what? Teaching. Teaching. What's that? Well, if it's deceitful <laughs> teaching. <laughs> don't don't to throw it over. No. False, teaching. False teaching. You are not blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine, everything that comes up, every new idea. You are, what did you say? Firm in your faith. Firm in your faith. You are stable. You know the truth. You understand the truth. You are not moved. So when someone comes along and says, oh, well, Jesus never really raised from the dead. No, I know he did. You cannot get me there. Uh, what are some other ones? How about Jesus was not really God? He was just a good prophet. He was a good man. How about that one? No, sure. Yes. Positive. <laughs> How about... God, there are many ways to get to heaven. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> we hear that all the time. 
Yeah. You hear that all the time. Yeah, many ways to get to heaven. Yes. Is that true? No. No? How is the gate to heaven? Narrow. 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 What is the other gate? Wide. 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 Huge. Many people are going that, but very few go through the gate, the narrow gate. Okay. So, this idea of maturity has both, I'm not worldly anymore, I've grown out of the worldliness, the selfness of, of my existence, I'm living for Christ. Paul says, uh, I count all things but dung. Right? All the things that he had gained, all the things that he was, his prestige, his pedigree, his knowledge, his, his uh, education, was just nothing. So that was worldly. What about this last one? The last one was about false doctrine. You're solid. You're, you're firm. You're not able to be knocked over. Not only knocked over by false doctrine, but not knocked over by doubt. Isn't that, a, isn't that an interesting one? Why is it so easy, or how can you measure someone's maturity in Christ by what, by what they do in a trial or in a hard time? They succeed. They succeed. What does that mean, though? If you're successful in, through a trial, you come out of the trial, okay, what does that mean? How can you look at somebody who's in the middle of some really heavy testing, the Lord's really testing their faith. How do you see maturity? So they come out on the other side either the same or better than when they came in. Well, same or better. But I'm talking right in the middle of the storm. Right in the middle. You know, you're, they're in the boat. The waves are going like this all over the place. And how do... They're, not confused. they're asleep. They're trusting the Lord. <laughs> they're not confused. They're trusting the Lord. What? They're asleep. No, well, they aren't. Oh, well, Jesus was asleep. Yeah, that's true. They still have faith. Like, they, they know that they may not know how God is going to handle it, but they know that God is going to handle it, and so they're just going to persevere because they know that in his time he's going he's gonna to do what he needs to do. What is that knowledge? What knowledge? What, what would you have to know to know that God's got it under control no matter what's going on? You know He'll get God. you through it. Huh? You know the Father. He's you know the Father. You know Jesus. You know Jesus. Hang on to that, okay? Let's go back to 1 John now. Let's go back to 1 John. One of the things that, that this story reminded me of, uh, or this section reminded me of, the first part is, in verse 12, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And then if you drop down to the end of verse 13, I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. Now, for a child, we talked about this idea of spiritual growth. And that as you mature, you're not knocked around. Your discernment is better. Your ability, your wisdom is better. Your foundation is better. And I remember as a child, actually I shouldn't say this because I don't remember this. But I will be told about this, about my childhood, until I am probably old and ready to give up the ghost. As a toddler, I had a fixation on the little white knobbies that covered the, the screws on the bottom of the toilet bowl. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, they, they cover it, they're little decorative looking things, usually made out of porcelain or something, right? I loved those things. Why? Because they were cold. And they felt so good on my gums as I was teething. <laughs> and I would crawl into the bathroom and grab those little knobbies And my mother would come in, Matthew! No, 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 no. She'd get them out and put them in there and walk them out. And, and I would do that again and again. And I would sit like on the, you know where the little, the little metal strip is? I would stand on the air. And if One mama hand. disappeared, <laughs> you know, I wanted that plastic knob. The, that little ceramic knob. It felt good. What's wrong with that? 
It's dirty. Germy. Germy. It's attached to the toilet. It's a. <laughs> Obviously, it wasn't because I could pull them off and stick them on my mouth. <laughs> yes. The idea was it was it wise for me to put something that filthy into my mouth? Not that my mother didn't keep the house clean, but was it is it wise? Is it a good thing to do? No, it's foolish. It's a foolish thing to do. But does the child know? No. So as a child in the Lord, there are some things that we we just don't know any better. Our discernment is not where it should be. But what do we know? That the Papa says, don't do that. Yes. The Father says, don't put that in your mouth. Therefore, whether you understand it or not, you know what Father says, and you have to trust his wisdom. Yes. Or... (laughs) Right? Okay. There's two things that are in here. Maybe I should have put this on the board. For the young, for the dear children, and we're really literally talking infants, young toddlers type, that age group. This is the young spiritual person. John says, there's two things that I know about you. One is in verse 12. What's the, what's the thing I know I know about you? Your sins have been forgiven. Let's stop right there and let's not add that last second part. Your sins have been forgiven. What is he saying? Christ died for you. Christ died for you. What does that mean? You're a child of God. You're a child of God. Period. End of discussion. Don't question it ever again. You know you're a child of God. How do you know? That's the second one. You know the Father. Right? Now, we are told that as children, the Holy Spirit comes inside us and confirms that we are God's, that we are his children. And what does the inside of us scream? Abba, Abba. Abba, Father. What does Abba mean? Daddy. Daddy. Now, when I used to work, and I would come home, and I would open the door, little three-year-old Alina, what do you think she would do? Come running. Come running. Daddy! Or Papa! Her deal was Papa. We used to say Papa. Papa! And she would come run, 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 and she would whop around my leg, just whop, and give me a big hug. Does she know what I do for a job? No. Does she understand my tax codes and the things that I have to do and pay? No. Does she understand my uh, relationships in the world and all the people that I know and all the. Uh, does she understand me, me, me? Really know me. No. What does she know? Knows Papa. I identify with Papa. That's all that the baby Christian may know. You're saved. You are his child. Secured and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. With the Holy Spirit deposited in you. And in that the Holy Spirit confirms that you're his child because in your heart you're going daddy papa and giving a hug that's the baby but do you stay there no what would happen if you stayed there would it seem normal probably not I want to talk about one other thing in the and we'll chat later. Um, <laughs> you get no no food after we're done. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, in chapter in verse twelve, he says, "I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven." But he doesn't end there. There's a little tag on the end of that. What's the tag, Esther? What's on the end of it? Through Christ? It says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins are forgiven through Christ. And that's the period? Uh-huh. Okay. Does anybody else have a, a different ending to that? on account of his name. On account of his name, anybody else? Something different? Does anybody have for his namesake? No? It is true it's in Christ. That is a true statement. 
That's not, that's not saying the translation is wrong. There is a, an interesting part on this, though. Your sins are forgiven on account of his name or for his namesake. What does that mean? If it's for your namesake, what does that mean? For his glory. For his glory. I want you to jump over to Isaiah chapter 61 really fast. Isaiah. We're going to bounce around a little bit today. 61. 61. Isaiah 61. Yep, it's almost right in the middle. Just a little bit to the right of middle. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Let me know when you got it. Got it? Uh, let's see. Who hasn't read yet? Me. I. You too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Would you read there, Larry, verses 1 through 3? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. Okay. The, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is, in, is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for all the prisoners, to claim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise, Instead of a spirit of despair, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, planting. a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Okay, I want you to look at that last that last section. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. What do you think that last part means? For the display of his splendor. To glorify himself. But what is the display part? To show off his glory. To show off his glory. Who do you think the oaks of righteousness are? Or the trees of righteousness? Who do you think, depending on your translation, who do you think those people are? Us? The children of God. So... Here we have uh, another metaphor, another word picture. We have oaks of righteousness. These are plantings of the Lord. That means the Lord has planted this seed. The Lord is growing this. And he's doing this for what reason? His glory. To display his glory, his splendor, his beauty, his righteousness, his justice, his holiness, his majesty. This is the purpose for what God is doing within us. So, dear children, dear little babies, anybody qualify as a little baby in the Lord? Don't have to raise your hand. If you are, hear what it means. Hear what it means. You are the Lord's work. You are the Lord's planting. You are that work that's done within you is to be used to display the glory of the Lord. Have you ever thought about what it means to be God's child? Have you ever taken a moment just to pause and say, okay, well, you know what? I know I'm the Lord's child. What does that mean? You know, I think a lot of times, and this is myself included, I think we forget who we are. Or we just simply don't know who we are. All the time? I think about it as, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? What's our purpose for being here? What do you think that purpose is? What is the purpose for being here? 
An oak. How long does it take to grow an oak? Slow growing. Long time. Long time. You have those big, majestic, mighty storm can come along, doesn't do anything with the oak. This thing, and it starts off as a little what is it, a little acorn. Doesn't it, doesn't start as an acorn. Okay, so you start as an acorn, and it grows to that thing. Have, have you ever seen one cut in half and counted how many rings? Hundred years, couple couple hundred years for these mighty, massive, strong oaks. If that's God's work, and they're not tossed about the waves are blown to and fro. Exactly. It's another good picture, isn't it? So you have a child, dear children. You have a young man, and then you have the fathers, and they're, they're not moved. They're solid. They've persevered. They've lasted. But how much is that time? <laughs> is, is, that a, is that a, oh, thank goodness, yesterday I was just sucking on milk and today I'm chomping on London broil and boy, I can handle anything. No, it takes time. It takes time. It's not a moment of time. I, I think he uses the grow metaphor because it takes time to grow. And it takes trials and nurturing, feedings. Sometimes you go backwards. Perhaps, or we're pruned. Yeah. I look at it more like it's a pruning. If it's dead, God's going to cut it off. And we'll grow more. But you understand that the Bible talks about the trials, the tribulations, the storms that come in our life, that that helps us grow in character and strength do you remember that yeah. a tree that is a small tree these little trees that we got little fruit trees in the backyard as time goes on storms hit storms hit grows growth. the tree will put more roots further down and spread it and grow it and go deeper and they'll f- try to find water if there's no water on the top they'll try to go deeper and try to find water is that not right Am I, I'm not a great agriculturist but the the storms, the trials, the times will make you stronger. That's that's a picture. But the idea that I wanted to say here was one: it takes time. How many saplings do you have in your circle of Christian friends that you really wish were mighty oaks by now? You really ah. Uh, so and so, so and so, I love her dearly, bless her soul. <laughs> but man, can she get on my nerves. Be careful with that. Why? What are you doing about it to help her? It's one thing to say, you know, this person gets on my nerves and they don't understand. It's another thing to take them under your wing, so to speak, and, you know help them to grow. You can't just stand there and look at someone and say, that is a baby Christian. See you later. Wow. Well said. What are you doing about it? If you Do you it, have to have patience then? Absolutely. You have to have patience for your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord? They're family. You have to... Watch do, you have family. to do you have to forbear with them? Do you know what that word means? What is forbear? Put up with? <laughs> yes, it is. Do you know what? I have read that. There's a verse in Ephesians that talks about being gentle, being kind, kind, patient, and forbearing. Bearing one another up. And I has always read that as, oh, you know, I'll help you out. You know, you need what? You need food? I'll help you food. That's not what that means. It's forbearance. It's when you are provoked. You are putting up with it. You're going to stick to it. When that little sapling's going, I'm here, I'm here, and gets in your face, you as a bigger oak, you as a bigger, stronger Christian, more mature, with patience and diligence and gentleness, exhort that one. Get that one back on track. You are supposed to. You're right. What did we read? That God is preparing his people, equipping his people, getting them together for the maturing of the body. We help one another. All right.
I could go on this for a long time. That, that, that to me was really cool. Which moves into fathers, 13 and, and 14. Strange, fathers are the same descriptive. Because you have known him who was from the beginning. What do you think that means? What does that mean? These are fathers now. This is in verse 13 and 14. These are the oaks. You have known him who was in the beginning, or who was from the beginning. I think he's talking about, the only thing that I see in that right now is, I think he's talking about um, when you become a man, when you become a father, you have responsibility and there's things going on, and you get so caught up in life and everything going on that you forget who your father is. And you think that you have to do all of it and you have to handle it. You're the provider now. But you forget that there is one that provides, that has a plan, that can set everything up. So you still have to trust in him. Okay. Okay. That, that would be an application, I think, of, of where that would go. <laughs> What do you think the verse is talking about? What, are the, what does it mean? We all, we, children knew the Father, right? This is, you have known the Father who is from the beginning. I think it's um, different than knowing Papa. Knowing you're my Papa is like you said. The child knows nothing about your work, about your dealings outside the home. The mm-hmm. child is little and knows only that you're Papa and that you will take care of her or him. Mm -hmm. But knowing the Father who is from the beginning implies you're aware of his works all through time and the, the grand things that he's involved in. It seems to me much a much bigger picture. Him who is from the beginning? Beginning of what? The beginning. Does a child even know what a beginning is? Okay, you brought into you brought into uh, the conversation the idea of time. Right? Time. And you asked, well, what is the beginning? Which beginning? How about the beginning of God? If I know, when I say God was in the beginning, what am I referencing? What, what about him am I referencing? Creation. And? Jesus. Where's the beginning of God? He was, he was there already. The eternal past. He's been there forever. He has been a part of everything, every step of the way. What if it's the beginning of my walk with him? My knowledge, my understanding of him. What if that's the beginning? What is it then? What is it that I know about him then? In my verse 14, it says, I write you fathers because you know the one who existed from the beginning. I write to you young people because you are strong. The teaching of God lives in you and you have defeated the evil one. Evil one. So in that reference, it's who's existed from the beginning, meaning the beginning of time. However, it could mean from the beginning who has been there with you, existed with you since your be, relationship began. It could, it could be either one. We don't really know, and I don't know that it really matters to have, oh, it's absolutely this one. The idea is that you've had time with him. You know him intimately. It's not just, Daddy, like you said. It's, let's sit down. Let's sit down, Papa. Let's, let's walk together for a while. I, I know what makes you happy. I know those little quirks and the little personality traits that put a smile on your face and those things that you really wish I didn't do. I know how you would look at a particular situation because I've seen you look at that situation many times in my walk with you. I understand you more. I know you. When a husband and wife first get married... Do they really, are they the same? Are they one, one, one like they are if they've been married for 30 years? No, no, no. You have these dreams, these expectations, these fantasies about what it's going to be like. And life has a tendency to 
knock out all of Hollywood out of your marriage. <laughs> and you end up with, oh, well, this is really, really what oneness means and being bonded and being made one flesh, what it really means. Maybe it's sickness and walking through that time. That's part of what I think is going into this father part, why it's different than the child. The child knows daddy. The father has walked with him and spent time in communion and relationship with him, has been steadfast with him, has been through the storms and still survived. What my Bible commentary says. It does? Yeah. I like your Bible commentary. <laughs> How about young men, 13 and 14? Uh, the first one in 13 is because you have overcome the evil one, and 14 because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Okay, let's knock this out of the ballpark. Who's the evil one? Satan. Satan, okay. For the sake of argument, let's just leave it at Satan, and I don't disagree with you, that is right, but it, well, we, it doesn't say Satan, it just says evil one. So we're going to assume Satan. Okay, if it is Satan, then what does it mean to have overcome the evil one? It's in both verses. It's in both references to the young man. He can't influence you anymore. Can't influence you anymore. In what way? What do you mean by that? Overcome temptation because why? Because Satan is busy tempting you? Because well, Jesus is taking care of you. So how do how do you I have a relationship with him. you have a relationship with him? Because the Holy Spirit resides in you, he will not allow you to continue to sin. Will not allow you to continue to sin. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And evil will, uh, when you're, uh, well, the shield of faith. We had that's the yeah. that's the armor passage. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. What do you think, Jennifer? You think he's talking about sins, overcoming temptation? You think that's what Satan is busy doing? That his that his focus. In this world is to tempt Christians? I think that's one of the things he does to because he has a focus. I don't think that's directly his focus. <laughs> She's looking at me like Did I say that right? Did I say that? <laughs> I think that's how he goes about doing what he's trying to do. Well, we have Jesus okay. Jesus over came his t testings and temptations of Satan by quoting scripture. And the second description says, because you young men are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. And the only way you overcome the evil one is the way Christ did it with the word of God. Very good. You jumped that part and that's perfect fine. I don't okay. care. That's, that's good. Yes. He overcame by the word. The word was with it. You know the word. It's inside you. You're grounded and you're able to overcome. The question is, is and I, I, wanted, I want to fish you a little bit on this one. Was Jesus tempted to sin? Yeah. No. Well, was that the purpose? Was that what Satan was trying to do? Was get Jesus to sin? Just sin, Jesus. Is that what he wanted? Satan wanted Jesus to... Go ahead. Say it. <laughs> doubt. To doubt. Well, doubt is a sin. You're doubting God. Maybe. If, to if obey. A, if Jesus had committed one sin, then he couldn't have been the Savior. He couldn't have been the Savior. I think he was trying to get Jesus to do it. Under his own power. Under his own power. He talks a lot about it. He's like, well, you know, you can call the angels to save you, so, you know, go ahead and jump off and you know, make it happen, basically. Not To not trust in his father. Okay, all right. You're, you're, you're on the right track. Let's get the three that he did. First one was take bread and turn it, or take the rocks and turn it into bread and satisfy your hunger. Well, no, 
Water. Right? Water. Huh? So another one with water, another one with him jumping off or something? Nope. With bread, jumping off, the angels will catch you. And what was the third one? Bow down to me. Bow down to whom? Satan, right? Now why would, why would Satan do that? Why did Satan make that one of them? What is it is the heart of Satan's existence. What does Satan want more than anything else? More power than God has. He wants to raise himself above God. He wants to replace God. He wants the worship. He want that's what he did. He wanted Jesus don't don't do what your father wants you to do. What did Jesus say? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right? That was one of them. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It was all about God. It was all about God. I will not put God in any other place other than who He is. Let's go look a little bit. I want to look at... Where do I want to go? Where do I want to go? How about James chapter 1? Go ahead. Go ahead. We all agree that when Jesus was on earth, he was fully man, but fully God. My question is, and what I can't figure out is that the devil attempted to get God to do something. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me, like why that would... He would even thought for a minute that that would be successful. Like, yes, he is man at that point, but he's still God. Like, God is not just going to be like, well, you know, I'll just bow down to you. I don't really understand that whole picture. I guess the question is, Jesus in man form, did he even have the ability, opportunity to choose to do those things? I think he had the ability, yeah. he ability been? as in the choices were there for him. Right. Because I, However, I, there was no sin within him to draw him or make sin attractive. Right. Because I think Nothing. If, if he's God, you know, yes. there, that's not even an option, period. Like, it's not in him right. at all. Right. So. But Satan didn't always have the best judgment because he thought he could overtake God in heaven and the rest of us are like, Really? <laughs> One of the, what does the Bible what does the Bible say about the heart? Deceitful. It's deceitful. Who does it deceive? Ourself. Yeah. Ourself. Do you think that Satan is deceived? <laughs> his, he himself is deceived. His own sinfulness, his own fallen evil. Do you think that that does not blind him to what's real? He knows what's happening. He knows what the Bible says about what's going to happen in the end. Well, Do you think he's he's dumb? <laughs> he's but he knows what's going to happen. He knows who God is. He he knows. Demons tremble, do they not? Yes. Okay, well, he's just a demon. He's just a creature. He's fallen. Look at James uh, chapter 1. Let's look at what happens with sin. Where And I want to ask you, where does Satan pop up in this? Okay. Chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 14 of James. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. All right, where's Satan? What do you mean? We usually point it down in the direction. But... Huh? So I'm, I'm looking for here, here's here's the here's a temptation, here is sin, here is death as a result of sin. At what time did j Satan jump into that process? Where does it show it? When tempted. What tempts us? Our own evil desires. Our own evil desires. Where is Satan? Are you saying he's not there at that point? I'm saying he's not there. Does Satan tempt? Yes. But I believe his temptations are very specific. He has a cause. He has a reason. He has a purpose. 
So well, according to this, it says that each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he's dragged away. Jesus had no evil desire. There's no way Jesus was tempted to do evil. Correct. There was nothing to pull him away. Right. Nothing. So when Satan came, we say he was tempted. What he did was his, he was presented a test. And Jesus won. Satan's primary goal is false doctrine, false religion. Get your eyes off of God. Put them on me. Get them off of God. Put them on me. He's known as the deceiver of nations in Revelation. I think it's more get them off of Jesus. Uh, that, that could be. Uh, because Jesus is the means God uses to save us. But Satan wants to be. God and Jesus, if you would. And there is an Antichrist coming. Yes. And, and he wants to be worshipped as the Christ. So I think that there is a competition uh, with Jesus. He wants to be better than Jesus, or he wants to be the Jesus, or something to that effect. He wants us to worship him instead of Jesus. Well, I think the most effective way that he does that is to, I guess it's like that saying, but to convince us that he doesn't exist. Which is convinced that he doesn't exist and that God's not the only way? God's not the only answer? Maybe there is no God? Look, look at uh, Second Thessalonians since you have gone there. Does anybody have to leave right away? Mm. We're, we're, yes. Uh, we are just talking about how you said that Satan's temptations are very specific and that the scripture said we just read it, that we're tempted by our own evil desires. Mm -hmm. Now, for the longest time, since forever, as far as I'm concerned, to me, um, I always felt like like we were tempted specifically by Satan all the time. Like if, like if you're experiencing temptation, that was, you know, Satan maybe, you know, talking to you or he's in your head, you know what I mean? Like that, that mm -hmm. voice... And I always thought it was described to me as that, and I always kind of like, you know, thought that. But now we're reading this, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, Scripture says that he's not tempting us, that it's our own evil desires, so are we saying that that is just us at that point? Sometimes it is Satan, but at that point, it's just us. I believe we give Satan way too much credit. That's my own personal belief. I don't recall... And I may be wrong. I don't recall Paul, Peter, James, John. I don't recall any biblical writer that wrote about his own temptations or, or struggles to be holy and pointed any part of it to Satan. Paul says... There is a war between my flesh and my spirit. They're always at war. That which I want to do, I don't do. That has nothing. To, there's no Satan in that passage. None. There's yes. When we read about Satan dealing with man, he's always saying, "Really? Did God say that? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? What God said? That's not true. I mean." He quoted scripture to Jesus saying, this is scripture. And Jesus came back with, yeah, but it is also written. Yeah. So there's always a challenge with Satan as to whether God is true and holy and what he says is right. Doesn't he always challenge there? I think he always challenges the character or truth of God. Yeah. If you look at the Garden of Eden, did he really say that? Did God really say that? There's, there's that doubt, that, that question of, is God really who he said he was? Did he really mean what he said? 
that type of thing. That doesn't. I'm not saying that Satan has no part in our temptation. He, but remember, Satan is not omnipresent, so he cannot tempt you if you're in Okinawa and tempt me in California per se at exactly the same instant. Now, they're, I, I believe they're fast. I don't think that they're, you know, but... See, I always figured he... I had never read anything that said he was or wasn't, so, you know, when it comes to Satan and demons and things like that, I always figured that <coughs> everyone, you know, like any time when that came up, you know, to sin or not to sin, because at its, at its base, most sins, as far as I'm concerned... Right before you do it, you have a choice. And you uh, know what's right and what's wrong. So I always figured uh, when you have those two voices in your head saying, go this way or go that way, that it was something tempting you one way or another. Mm. I'd, I'd never, I've never ever thought about whether or not, you know, trying to rationalize in my head whether the devil was omnipresent or not. So that's kind of an important fact. Well, if you think about what the Bible talks about sin, and I'm, I mean specifically when it talks about sin, not just battles or wars or wrestling, but I'm talking sin, specifically sin, look through the scriptures and find out where the Holy Spirit has led the writers of the Bible to say, this is the remedy, this is what you should be doing. I don't recall anybody saying, get rid of the demon. Get rid of the spirit that's causing you to do that. Get rid of the, you know, there's the stand firm. And Paul wanting to get rid of the body of this death that he has to yes. around. It wasn't the devil. No. It was the body, his own physical, fleshly body and desires. So go back to the first part, one of the first tests that we had. He who says he has no sin, the truth does not exist in him. It's, I am the one who is my worst nightmare. I am the one that causes me to fall and stumble. If I start there, perhaps if the devil ever does come to tempt me, I can stand a lot firmer because I'm strong in the Lord. I have the word of God living in me. It abides in me. And I overcome the evil one. I can overcome his schemes. His, he's the God of this age. He is the ruler or the prince of the power of the air. He controls this system, this worldly system. That's his baby. That is where he does his work. He deceives, he plots, he schemes, he drops false ideas, he gets people's eyes off Jesus, he gets people's eyes off God, he gets people's eyes into, off the truth. We were at a church one time, and the regular pastor was not preaching, it was the assistant pastor, and the assistant pastor got up and said, okay, everybody please, we're going to be reading today in John chapter 3, or something like that, right, some, some verse... And uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible that's in the back of the pew, and you can, you can uh, uh, reach and use that one. And uh, he goes on, he keeps going on, and this is probably 700 some odd people in this church, big church, been around forever. And all of a sudden you hear, crack! You know what the crack was? The Bible's being opened for the very first time. And he actually laughed and then caught himself and realized how embarrassing that little testimony was. The young man is strong. He has the word of God abiding in him. If you don't know the word of God, you aren't strong. You're a baby. You're a baby. You're a baby. Do I need to read my Bible? Do I need to know what its truths are? Yes. Do we have an absolute passion and love and do we cherish that Bible, that Word of God? Usually, no. We can go through a whole, a whole uh, uh, worship service at times. We can go through a whole Bible study and never open up the Bible. 
How about in your personal life between Monday and the following Sunday? Do you open up your Bible? Do you read on a regular basis? Are you feeding on God's Word? Are you, able, are you giving the fertilizer to your soul so that the roots go deep and you grow into that big oak tree? Or are you still the baby who's just happy that, you know, oh, I just, Daddy, I just want a hug. That's it. I'm happy. Sit on my lap. And that's it. You know, there's, that's a beautiful thing to be that child. But it is sad, as Paul said, when you should be older. Well, look at these kids here. You've got uh, a couple of youngsters that are getting super food, super grow on their roots, where their friends aren't getting it. Mm. And... I think this is excellent, an excellent example of what's going to make you grow into a big oak, stronger, faster before your friends, so that maybe you can nourish them. It's true because I didn't, I didn't get this early on. You know, I had, I, I have been taught a lot of stuff from my mother, but a lot of the most important things that I found out, I had to find for myself. And I don't mean like I explained last week and the week before, like finding your faith for yourself, but I just mean like, shoot, go through anything that Paul wrote. Like that is some Mm -hmm. of the most important things that I've read about who we are. And I didn't have that before because I never looked at it. Right. You know? Well, that's good. You need the word. You need to be in it. It needs to be in you. You need to be abiding in it, living in it. And then you will overcome the evil one. Whatever schemes he has, whatever plots and ploys, whatever's going to come down, you go, uh uh. I recognize that. That's not truth. I recognize that. That's a false lie. Or that's, a, that's a lie. That's a false religion that doesn't work. That's not how God does it. That's not how Papa does it. I think I'm going to stop there. I was going to go into the next section, but I want you to look at the next section. The next section says, do not love the world. There's a couple things involved with that. I would like to know, if we are not supposed to love the world, then why did Jesus, or why did Jesus say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth not should not perish but have everlasting life? What is the world that we are not to love? And what does it have to do with what we just talked about? For God so loved us. Do you know the words are the same? Do not love the cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos. Exact same word. What is it that John, in this passage, in the next couple verses, is talking about when he talks about do not love the world? Yes. Jesus didn't die for the cosmos. He did not? He died for mankind. So are we not to love mankind then? Yes, we are. Well, I have a contradiction in the Bible then because the word says do not love the cosmos and then another one says that God did love the cosmos. It kind of makes sense. There are no contradictions? Right. You're right. That's why I want you to go away and I want you to study it and come back and tell me what it's all about. Why? What is it about the cosmos? What is it about the world? What is John talking about? He hasn't left his topic concerning overcoming the evil one. He's still on that topic. He's just taking it to a different look. A different different angle. Okay? And get in the word. You have to get in the word. It's important. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I, I just kept going and going and going and going. And, and I, I hope, Lord, that you were not hindered by anything that was said or anything that I did. Father, I pray that your spirit will have spoken to hearts and that we will have heard his voice and that as a result we'll go away and we'll talk to you 
will go to Abba Father, will come to you and say, Abba Father, I need to sit on your lap for a while. Maybe I'm not growing very well. Maybe I'd rather uh, be of an age where I'm, I'm more like a, an old oak. And I'm solid in the temptations of the world and the things of the world and the attractions of the world and, and the temptation or the, the trials and the storms. The, they just don't bother me anymore as much as they used to. Because I know you. I know you who is from the beginning. Father, I pray that you would teach us, grow us. It's your work. You're the one that said you would complete it. So we pray that that be done, that we be willing subjects, and that we would grow according to what the gardener says we should be doing. If we don't know you, Lord, if we're not even your child, though, Lord, I pray that you would reveal it to us, that you would take the blinders off of our eyes and help us to see who you are that we would see Jesus, and that we would love him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.